Yes, good morning students and welcome to the class of SAP. Today we have with us here Balaji sir. Good morning sir and a warm welcome to you sir. Good morning. Yes, sir. So sir will be taking up uh, the latest trends for SAP, global trends for SAP. So you may please start the session. Sir. OK, uh, thanks Janvi. Uh, a very good morning, uh, all these students who are online now. Uh, my name is Balaji and uh, I come with 25 years of experience in SAP at various levels as consultant, project lead, project manager, program director, head of SAP practice. The last I was working with SAP. Uh, now I am uh, with EME. Uh, today's session is going to be about how did SAP as a product evolve? What were the various stages? And what are you learning now and what is happening in the next, let's say, five to ten years? Plus that that's about the evolution of uh, SAP. Then I'm going to talk about how exactly is SAP implemented in a real life scenario. In the sense, if there is a company which is implementing SAP, how do they do it? OK, and what you heard till now, what you learned till now in various sessions was about using SAP. But now I'm going to talk about how to make this product SAP usable. That is. In other words, known as implementation, how SAP is implemented actually, what is the methodology used, etc. And then lastly, I'm going to walk you through the career options an individual has in SAP. Then at last, I'll be taking Q&A. Uh, I understand you can share, send your questions in chat, and uh, uh, I will be asking Janvi to ask those questions on your behalf and uh, I'll be responding to those uh, questions. OK, so. The session which is starting at 11, we will take a 10 minutes break around 12 o'clock and then we will be concluding the session by around 12.30, 12.45. Then there will be a 10 to 15 minutes open forum where you can ask any questions. So this is about today's session plus. A uh, few very, very important uh, messages I want to give before I start is that this is not a part of the original content that you would have got. This is whatever you are going to learn from now is purely uh, from the practical knowledge perspective or uh, from your in, in case you attend an interview or have a discussion on SAP. This is something for that. This is not a part of any assessment. You will have to go through an assessment to get your participation certificate. This is not a part of any assessment. This is pure additional information we are giving. And this additional information is being given to each of you as students so that you get the practical flavor of this training. One is understanding various business processes. Second, understanding SAP as a product, as an ERP, plus also using it, how to use it, what are the various reports that can be taken out, how do you do data entry, how do we enter data, how does the financial data flows, all those things you have already seen in, uh, in the various sessions earlier. And today's session is purely on how SAP is ge getting implemented. What was SAP when it started? When it started? And what is it today? And why is it this change? And how different is it? Plus, I'm going to give you a very detailed explanation about how exactly SAP is implemented in the real world. SAP is not a product that you just bring in, like Microsoft you have, you just plug in, you put in your license key and start using it. It doesn't work like that. There's a lot of configuration that happens in the back end. I'm sure Nagaraj would have shown you where some screens where configuration and customizations are done. So that is exactly how exactly would be done. What is the methodology is what I'm going to talk about. And finally, there is one slide I'm going to show you about what are the various career options you have and how lucrative or how is this job market in SAP behaving? And I will also be correlating with you in terms of costing professionals. How is it relevant for a costing professional? So that's that's what uh, today's session is going to be about. And I repeat at the cost of repetition, 
that whatever you are going to hear or learn today is not a part of assessment. So you cannot expect any questions from this two hour session, but this will be a very valuable session for every individual that when you are having a conversation with somebody or when you are attending an interview to talk about your SAP knowledge, this will be very, very helpful. OK, let's move on. Now SAP, as we all know, is a German company. It started. It was started by four engineers who moved out of a company called IBM, which was famous for their mainframes uh, in the year 1972. Uh, they, they, then they started this company called uh, SAP uh, in a place called Waldorf in Germany. So in case somebody knows Germany, this is uh, 20, it's, it's a village actually, small village, 20 kilometers or so from Frankfurt. So if you if whenever I was in SAP, we used to visit Waldorf. That used to be you land in Frankfurt and then take a taxi another half an hour drive from there. You reach Waldorf. Actually, it's a small village. There's nothing else other than SAP there now, even now. OK, so SAP started with mainframe. To the left, what you see is this is how the screens were. Uh, if, if, if we know how the uh, computers evolved, initially it was those punching cards, then those it was computer screens. Then today there are screens all over. Even a watch is a screen, uh, mobile is a screen, tab is a screen. But those days it used to be only desktops. OK, in the year 1972, they started as a mainframe system. It was R3. The, the architecture of the system was only two. One was an application or a database plug application layer and then the screen. There was a two tier architecture. In the year 1992, they launched their first client server architecture, which was known as R3. Now, what is the difference? Here, one, you have a database layer which holds all the data. Now, whatever transactions we see on the screen, is to has to be saved somewhere. OK, these are saved in something called database. OK, and how it is saved in database is something it's a bit technical. Let's not talk about it. Database, there are various types of database. One of them is RDBMS, Relational Database Management System. So this is saved in rows and columns in, in a database. Then you have an application layer. Now, what is an application layer? Application layer is where you have all the logic. The the calculations, the logic, all those things are in application layer. Now what is what is the logic? For example, if some if we are doing a billing, OK, the invoice we say 100 rupees and we give a particular HSN code. Then on a particular product, the system will know it is 18 percent. It says your GST is 18 percent for 100 rupees. It is 18 percent GST, which is 18 rupees. The total is 118 rupees. This logic is in this application layer. OK, not only that, if you want to take out a report, like for example, how many purchase orders have we released in the last 10 days? How much money have, have we received in the last 10 days or last one month? Which GL account was posted on so and so date to so and so date? What are the amounts? So all those details are taken out as reports. Now, therefore, you to get that report, we'll have to put this query across to the system. So that query, uh, the logic for picking up the data for this query is all in this application layer. Then finally comes the front end, that is the uh, the layer which which we see. So you have three views. OK, that's how the R3 architecture came in. Please note this was in 1992. There was hardly any presence of Internet. OK, and uh, laptops were very, very bulky. 92s, there were hardly any laptops. And uh, they were, even if it was there, it was as bulky as a desktop only. Uh, and it was the desktop era. Come late 90s or early 2000s, Internet started booming. We also had the e-commerce burst um, that was in the later part of 2000. So in 2000, the Internet started coming in. But I still remember personally, uh, we used to access this using a 64 kbps or 128 kbps 
connectivity. Okay, so if I tell somebody it is 128 KB, kbps connectivity cable that we used to have, we you, you uh, young students would laugh at it because our mobiles today have much much more speed today, but those days it was it was not existent. So when 2004, when internet slowly the data speed started increasing, this threw this open to internet. It was through mysap.com. That was in the year 2004. That is where the transformation came in, wherein from a desktop, uh, in a particular desktop, you'll have to access your system um, uh, from uh, physically in a particular LAN that is uh, local area network. It moved to internet so that we can move anywhere, but of course you needed the GUI that you, we all use today. Uh, that GUI is what is required. With that GUI only, you will have to access. But then you can access the system from anywhere else using your desktop or laptop. That was again in the year 2004. Now, in mid 20, I mean, another 10 years down the line, lots of changes happened in the IT industry. The connectivity speeds shot up from KBPS to MBPS. Now we are talking about GBPS gigabytes per second plus the laptops become very slim okay and we also got the revolution of mobile now in the year 2000 if i told that we can access data using this mobile people would not have believed i still remember when uh, the first mobile phone i got way back in 99 was a bulk huge mobile huge mobile which I had to, uh, you know, uh, for incoming, I had to pay money. For outgoing, of course, we had to pay. And uh, it was bulky, it was just voice calls. It was as good as the telephone handset that we were carrying in our pockets. But today, as I was just showing you on the screen, if you can see my photograph, this is the phone. Every transaction that we do is all done on this piece of equipment. Everything, including SAP, can be accessed in this phone. Now, this revolution started in maybe 2010, 2012 onwards. So in 2015, the 2015, 2016, SAP launched a very new, uh, I mean, out of the way, uh, very different uh, uh, solution on SAP called HANA. HANA, you remember I just spoke a few minutes back about RDBMS as a database. HANA is a columnar database. It's a bit technical. Let's not go there. But still, uh, HANA was launched. It was the fourth generation HANA, which they called as S4 HANA. In 2015, they launched something called Digital Core. Now, we have the standard SAP that is there, which is a three tier architecture. SAP is there, which we were, you are at, we are all accessing. Using the GUI, you all would have had that uh, GUI launch pad. You click on it, you put in your client user ID and password, you go through, and then you access SAP system. Okay. But then that is possible only when we have these machines and then we have the GUI. But now with HANA, you can access the same anywhere from any equipment. Now, what does this mean? This means that you don't need to sit in front of a desktop or a laptop to work on this. You can use your mobile or you can use your tab, your iPad or whatever tab that you have and do SAP transactions. That is the revolution that they brought in. Now, having brought in that, how do we move from the existing SAP system to this system? Just a second. From this system that we were right now using, that is ECC, to the HANA, how do we move? Or if it's a person who's, if it's an organization or a company starting afresh, it will be all on HANA. But somebody who's already using SAP, let me give an example. Reliance, Indian Oil Corporation, HPCL, Hindustan Petrol, Petro, uh, Petroleum uh, Corporation Limited, ONGC, Gale, the Gas Authority of India, Gale Gas in Mumbai, it is a Mahanagar Gas Limited in Pune, Maharashtra Gas Limited, 
natural gas limited mngl so the host of companies who are already on ecc how do they move to this can they move and that's what i'm going to talk later in something called the activate methodology later in 2017 they came out with a very holistic comprehensive solution which is known as the hana solution which has various components which includes customer experience sap hybris then you have success factors for the human capital management you have uh, field glass for workforce management then you have ariba sap ariba which is for procurement processes and then uh, you have lenardo which is the ai and iot the in thing that we are all talking about today and sap hybris for that matter is a typical e-commerce solution so if anybody has used tata click or um, uh, the reliance ago.com they are all on sap hybris okay so that's how sap has evolved from a simple mainframe solution to a a solution which is which is so intuitive so user friendly that anybody can use it even on their on the move they can do transactions in uh, sitting in a car traveling in the road or anywhere that's how the transformation of sap has come in this is what i call as the sap journey now having spoken so much let me also show you how exactly it looked like to the left what you see is what you see as from the past this is how the screens were now even the screens that you would be seeing in sap gui would be what you see in the left what i have shown as a desktop screen you can of course access it from laptop the difference when the when we when sap started with r3 and then ecc uh, which is uh, which has been used to, to till uh, even now it's used in most of the companies is that uh, you can use it on any equipment it can be a laptop it can be a tab as long as you can have the uh, sap gui and downloaded and accessed from that screen they move to the current screen to the right side what you see is a desktop a tab and a mobile now when we move from that screen to multiple screens now what what is happening is today the customer is accessing data from any screen now let me throw a, it throws a very uh, classic challenge now what is the classic challenge see i am right now seeing a laptop which has a big screen you can see here in between there is a big screen this is a laptop it's a big screen now when we go for a tab it's much smaller then when we switch to a mobile the screen is even smaller okay so from a big screen to a smaller screen to a small screen but the screen should look alike the screens should exactly look alike now that forces that that throws up a challenge so sap has come out with a beautiful solution called fiori so using fiori the screens are very very intuitive you can see those styles it's so user friendly from what you see when you are practicing sap fi you will see the screens to the left okay now what you see here are the very intuitive user friendly screens so you may ask me a question why don't you give us the screens for practice it's very simple we prefer when you are learning please learn with these screens so that when you switch to these screens it is much easier now what is the parallel i would like to draw when you are learning to drive a car it is strongly recommended that you learn to drive a car with a with manual gears because once you can drive manual gear automatic is much easier okay so what you are going to do here here is that the screens that you see to the left similar screens on exactly this much similar screens is what you will see you will learn now once you learn and if you are moving into a hana environment or ecc with fiori screens you will see the screens what you are seeing in the, in the right the user experience is much better you need not remember any transaction codes and it's all there as styles you can see the styles and uh, very colorful insightful dashboards are there which gives the picture right in the beginning to i mean the moment you log in you know what are your tasks you need to do what is pending what is the status etc okay so this is how the sap journey was 
I'll quickly recap what I spoke in the last 15 minutes or 20 minutes is we started SAP started as a mainframe solution, switched to a client server solution. Then came the Internet era where we got SAP access on the Internet. Then came the mobile era uh, where we have all the screens on the mobile. Now uh, I even know today people talk about smart watches. Of course, the screens are too small and you don't do any transactions on small smartwatch. It's more of a uh, system that gives the user experience in terms of showing what is in the screen, which you can go and access the data on your screens, which can be a tab or a mobile. Then came a very comprehensive holistic solution from SAP, which is various solutions bundled in together. Another major difference that you will notice if uh, an old timer in SAP and the new things in SAP is earlier the screens were not that user friendly as I just showed earlier. Now they are very user friendly and very colorful screens. So as is as is showed to the left, these are all blue screens from the past to the colorful intuitive uh, very uh, user friendly screens of Fiori or S4 HANA screens. OK, I'll just show another very interesting screen of what is the current S4 HANA screen, how it looks like. So the moment you log in, this is how you see, which means every it is all in the in the form of apps. And uh, you will see these this dashboard depending upon. Of course, it all depends on what access a person has and what sort of reports uh, is provided uh, to an individual. Please note SAP has a very tight access control. When I say access control, what does this mean? It means whatever you are supposed to see, only those screens you will have access to. You will not have access to every transaction that is there in the system. So you will have only if you are a person who is, let's say, doing financial transactions, only those access will be there. And here again, we have SOD, that's segregation of duties, uh, which is purely based on SOX, that is Sorbonne's Oxley's Act. Now, what are these two? I'll just explain, though these screens also will be uh, uh, similar to what I'm talking about, is segregation of duty means, I'll just give a very simple business process. I'll explain that using a business process. Let's say it's a P2P, procure to pay, I'm sure. You would have heard this term P2P and you would have also gone through more details about the P2P process in the earlier sessions that is procured to pay. Now let's see what the process is. The process is first you start the procurement process with a, a purchase request. OK, somebody raises a purchase request and somebody else approves the purchase request. Now, How does the flow go through when somebody else who approves the purchase request? Uh, a person who creates cannot approve the purchase request. The person who's approving the purchase request cannot sign the purchase order. OK, once the goods are received, the goods inward, that is GI, that cannot be made by the person who's approving the purchase order. OK, and then once the goods come in, then it, uh, let's assume the quality and all is all cleared. Somebody has to make the payment. OK. That again has to be a different person. All these are controlled through access control. These are known as segregation of duties where every individual's duty duty is very separated. And the problem just imagine the same person creates a purchase request. Also approves it. Creates the purchase order, approves the purchase order, does the goods in world, also clears the payment. So the probability of error deliberate or unintentional human error is very very high okay hope you understand the term unintentional human error so to avoid all this there is something called SOX that is sorbent oxy slack which talks about segregation of duties there are so many things including segregation of duties so here in segregation of duties it is very clear that every individual's duty is well segregated and that is well managed within the sap system OK, so I also touched upon the various screens and uh, uh, what is segregation of duty and also touched upon uh, gave an example of B2P that is uh, procured to pay and then I pushed moved ahead with 
what is segregation of beauties and what is access control. OK, and before I go to how uh, uh, we can move to HANA, S4 HANA, what is what is happening in the world today? What are the global trends? I will also discuss few minutes on the particular screen that uh, you're seeing on the screen. See, this is talking about a sales screen wherein a sales manager is able to track incoming orders. How many sales orders have been completed? How many back orders are there? What is the margin of each of these? Just imagine a sales person or a sales manager gets such a dashboard. He or she can take a very quick decision on what has to be done. Let's assume in a particular month the margins are low. They can quickly and go drill down and see why the margins are low and fix it. If the back back orders or the pending orders are very high, they can drill down and find out why there is delay in delivery and then they can fix it. Similarly, if the incoming order is very less, let's say in a particular month, <coughs> I'm sorry, in a particular month, if the incoming orders are very less, they can have a discussion with the sales team. So this particular screen that you are seeing, this is from the sales managers dashboard, which talks everything about uh, what is required in sales, a sales manager would need. And these are such colorful, uh, good screens and reports that makes it very user friendly at the same time, full of information and data. And by double clicking on each of these tiles, they can actually drill down and get into the details and take the right business decision that would help them improve their business. Now, next screen is talking about the purchase. OK, here we are talking about what is the purchase requisition? What is the touch? What are the orders? How many orders are pending? How many contracts are pending? How many is the what is the outstanding that is there? How many purchase orders are overdue? All those details are there in this single screen. So a purchase manager gets in and then if there is any alarm which is shown in red or or whichever way they want to present, which can be customizable, they can take a decision, drill down, find out where things are getting stuck, where things are getting uh, delayed and they can fix it. OK, so this is about S4 HANA, very user friendly. Now comes the question. If S4 HANA is so user friendly, have everybody switched to S4 HANA? I'll just take a minute's break and get back. Okay. Sorry. OK, now. Few questions that may come up. Have every customer switched to S4 HANA? Is it that S4 HANA is the only thing in the world in future? And what's going to happen to the existing system of ECC? And how do we move to S4 HANA? So let me answer each of these questions. Number one, not everybody has switched to S4 HANA. And SAP does provide support. They have agreed that they will support, I think, till 2030. It's not an official word. I'm not a spokesperson of SAP. I'm only an ex employee of SAP. I am not a spokesperson of SAP, but what is available in public domain is that they will be supporting ECC or the existing system that you all have been accessing till 2030, which is another six years. Now, what are the conditions for that? Only SAP person can answer. Next, have all moved to S4 HANA? The answer is no. The transition is slowly happening now. Now, how is the transition happening? I'll talk about various scenarios how SAP ECC can be moved to S4 HANA. OK, next. Uh, why haven't they moved to S4 HANA when it is so intuitive, such good reports are? The reason is that there is huge investment that has already been made in implementing ECC, the system that you all have been practicing. Now, it's not easy to throw away that investment and switch to a new system. Though the licensing of SAP is different, you don't need to pay for licenses, but there is some amount of, of investment that is involved in moving from your existing system to the new system of uh, HANA. OK, so that is where uh, we are moving. In. I again repeat what I spoke in the beginning. Why is this session being taken for a CMA Intermediate Student? It's for you to understand what is happening in the world in real life. What are the current global trends? 
and how th things are proceeding in terms of ECC and S400. Because when you start talking about, you no, know, I have learned SAP, immediate question is, is it HANA? So you should also understand what is HANA. And that's the reason we have had the special session. And I repeated the cost of repetition that whatever you're learning and listening today is not a part of the assessment. It's just purely for your knowledge. And uh, I will be taking the Q&A sessions and whatever questions are there, you may please put in the chat and I will definitely take it up. OK, moving on. Now, how do we deploy this S4 HANA? How do we do it? No, first, very the simplest thing is. It's a brand new implementation in the sense. A company A has just started. They don't have a ERP system at all. Uh, they just want to implement ERP system. Beautiful. They go ahead using the activate methodology and implement it straight. It's very simple. So whether you implement it in ECC, which was done till now, now it the latest thing is S4 HANA. So you will you'll go ahead for the S4 HANA. Perfect. OK, so that's the simplest of the uh, solution. Now, next is an existing ERP system is there. So what do we do? How do I go to S4 HANA? So SAP provides you various tools which helps you to study what is the difference that you will face. What are the um, codes the, that has to be changed? What are the business processes that has to that will change? There is a tool with which they study and then give a detailed report. Based on that report, you need to do those fixes and what we call a system conversion or a migration from an ECC system to an S4 HANA system. OK, it's a simple conversion wherein you convert from the existing SAP system to an S4 HANA system. OK, next let's take an example of uh, let's say Nestle. Or Cadbury's or Colgate. Now what happens to these companies? Are they're all multinational companies, right? They have a very large presence in India. They have very large presence in the Americas. They have very large presence all over the world. So what would happen is they will have various ERP systems. OK, some may be running uh, ECC uh, 6 enhancement package 18. Some may be running on ECC 5. Some would have already moved to S4 HANA or in the process of moving to S4. So when such a complex scenario is put across, what we do is we call something called consolidation. There are various way of consolidating these systems. We consolidate it and we do something called landscape transformation. Wherein you consolidate region wise, depending upon what their strategy is. Like for example, HP uh, went into a global uh, template. They wanted one single global SAP S4 HANA system. So HP, if you will have Picard, uh, also came out of uh, certain businesses and certain businesses, they moved out, let's say digital, they moved out in quite a few areas. They moved out consulting, they moved out and they wanted to focus on printers and stuff like that. So there what they did, they moved the complete global operations. I think the whole project was led from Singapore to a single one global S4 HANA system. I just gave one example. So these are the various scenarios that uh, the world is faced with today. I, let's take the example of uh, Reliance. Reliance, let's talk about the oil industry. The, uh, they are petrochemicals. Uh, they have the world's largest integrated um, refinery in Jamnagar. It is the world's largest. Uh, what I understand is 10% of the crude that gets refined in the world is happens in Jamnagar which means every 10th car that is getting filled is from the gas or the petrol or the diesel or the uh, petroleum products is from Jamnagar. They went in for a very large business transformation project under the name of Smart Transformation. Uh, this they went live, if my memory serves right, in 2015. Now having moved on to a new SAP system, they moving to S4 HANA is still not a decision is still not taken. They will be moving to S4 HANA after 10 years. 
So that is going to be very complex as for HANA transformation. They may take a transformation or they may go in for a simple migration. So I just gave you a few live examples with names of corporates, which is very relevant in this uh, country. And most of the names I spelled out um, are again my personal uh, uh, information. Um, uh, it's it's purely from not from nothing to do with any of these organizations. OK, uh, I'll go ahead for the next 10 minutes uh, and then we will be taking a break. But before we take a break, I'll take a few questions. So I will I'll be requesting uh, my colleague Janvi to ask those questions and I'll be responding to those questions. So I first talked about what is how SAP moved, what has been the transformation that has happened within SAP, how different is the SAP R3 to HANA, and then what is HANA, S4 HANA, and then I also talked about how SAP HANA can be deployed in a real life scenario. OK, now. Any implementation of SAP or the various business transformations. We use a methodology called activate methodology. Earlier it used to be ASAP methodology. Now it is known as activate methodology. Now why activate? Why not ASAP? And why do we need a methodology? So that is what I'm going to answer now. Firstly, when we are doing SAP implementation, you would like to have the best global best practices implemented in the organization. So where do they get the global best practices for SAP implementation? Before even going in for an implementation, every organization would like to see a proof of concept because the investment is huge. Uh, uh, we are talking of an implementation which goes on for six to eight months, sometimes even one year. Now one year, of implementation of 50 people, 100 people, such an investment, can we see a small proof of concept? Is it going to add value to the company? So that was missing. Next, how can SAP as an organization help their customers in implementing SAP? How, what sort of guidance do they give? How can they help in implementing? And finally, as a project manager, the question that is always there is, how do I manage this project? Where do I start and where do I end? How do I start it? OK, that's where a methodology was given by SAP. Initially, there was no methodology. Later on, we had a methodology called ASAP methodology, which had five phases. Now we have moved to activate methodology. Now why activate? What is the difference between ASAP and activate? Now, if you see earlier, uh, you, I was sp speaking about you know, every screen was only on desktop, so it was only SAP ECC that was there. There was nothing called cloud. OK, we, would, we have not heard of a term called Amazon maybe 20 years back. How many? We, there was no mobiles uh, 30 years back. OK, so now came the cloud solutions. Then you have on-premise solutions where you have the data center physically in every office. Every organization will have their own data center, their own servers, their own database, which they will manage. Now, now things have become cloud and sometimes it is a combination of cloud and on premise solution. So then what they did, they came out with a common methodology for both cloud deployment and on premise implementation. That is where the activate methodology came into picture. Now, what is this activate methodology? First, you will discover there was a question that was asked. If you see here, I wish I could quickly do a proof of concept without big upfront investment. Yes, that is known as the discover phase. In the discover phase, you understand what is this whole solution about, how it will be deployed, what will happen. OK, and then you go ahead. Once you take a go, uh, give a go ahead decision, the project team is formed and then you start with the prepare phase. OK, in the prepare phase, we do all the preparations that are required for going ahead with the project. Then we explore the various business processes that you have and how it can be mapped into the SAP system. Now, once this business process mapping is done, we switch to a phase called realize phase, wherein we realize whatever we have discussed earlier. Then we deploy the solution and we run and maintain the solution. This is what the complete activate methodology means. 
OK, so this is about activate methodology. I'm going to talk in detail about each of these methodology uh, uh, right now. Uh, it's 1140, 40 minutes into the session. Janvi, are there any questions in the chat? Sir, one question is there. Yeah, please. Uh, the student says when you said authorization will be given for particular transaction, who will yeah. be the controlling authority for allowing access? OK, that's a very good question. I'll go back to that screen. Uh, the reason I wanted to take questions now, Janvi, is so that I can go to the relevant screens and I can uh, speak about that. OK, the deciding authority, the deciding authority would be what we call as the business process owner. OK, the business process owner has to decide about who will get what authorization and what access. Plus, not only that, that decision will be based on SOD because this system is an auditable system. Now, tomorrow uh, you for cost audit or a chartered accountant as a typical organizational audit, financial audit, they go on audit. When they audit, they will obviously check who approved it, and who cleared it and who created it. It has to be different. All these factors are taken and the business process owner decides who should get what access. I'll add one more point here. Imagine there is a person who is doing gate. We call it as gate entry, which means uh, a goods or goods inward or a product is coming in. You have it comes through a gate. Let's assume it's a very large factory. OK, let's take the example of let's say Reliance refinery. OK, it, it is spread over few kilometers. OK, at the gate when the goods enter, the invoice is getting entered by a security. OK, the security personnel will be entering the details of the invoice. Uh, what is coming in uh, into the gate? Uh, imagine this person also has access to see the p &L account. It is not fair, correct? A security is not supposed to see the p &L account or a balance sheet. Obviously, nor does uh, an accountant or, or not accountant, let's say a production planning person uh, is allowed to see what is the profitability of a product. No. So this is where the business process owner who decides who will get what access depending upon the rules. OK, a role is defined and relevant access is provided. This is done by a team called basis in, in the back end. Uh, there are three types of um, uh, consultants that are relevant for SAP implementation. One is the functional consultant. Like you all are costing professionals. You would come under the category of functional consultants who will provide the functional inputs and also do the customization. Next comes the technical uh, consultant. In technical, there are two types. One who manages this, this access control and manages the system. The hardware part of it is known as a basis consultant. Then you have a programmer. If there is any change, like for example, this particular screen is there. We don't want the pie chart to be to the left bottom. I want it to the right top right corner. So those changes are done by the technical team that is done by the uh, technical uh, HANA technical people. So this basis person would be doing it to answer your question. The decision is taken by the business process owner. OK, so any other questions? Yanni? So one more question. Dashboard can be developed by consultant or by power user. OK, interesting. Uh, in HANA, uh, there is, uh, of course, it becomes a bit too complex, but let me try and explain it in simple words. There is a uh, BW solution or a data warehousing solution wherein a power user is allowed to create these dashboards to whatever access you have in the sense uh, whatever, like for example, the, the screen, the, the one you're seeing on the screen is purchase relevant. This dashboard you're seeing is something to do with sales. OK, if you are a sales uh, power user, you are you will have relevant access and you can create these dashboards yourself. There are user friendly intuitive drag and drop solutions that are available with an SAP with which you can create these dashboards. However, just let me put a disclaimer also here. There are some very um, uh, high end logic if you want to put in and then you'll have to dig out data from a large database. Uh, let's say I want a report of profitability analysis of the last 10 years. 
where data is residing in so many different places, then you will need a technical person. But typically, whatever you're seeing on the screen, these can be done by the power user themselves. OK, hope I answered it in as simple language as possible. Any other questions, Jan? Uh, no, sir. These many questions. OK, fine. So the time now is 11.46. Is it too early for a break? Um, we will take a short break now for, um, let's say, 10 minutes and we'll assemble back at 11.56. Is it OK? Yes, yes sir. Yes. OK. Students will take a 10 minutes break and we'll be back by 11.56. So, yeah, Anaji, sir, keep yeah, your uh, screen uh, shared, sir. Otherwise, the screen will become blank. Your oh, screen should be so? shared, sir. Yes. Okay. So, because I thought of seeing your questions, but I can't see any questions with that. Yes. Not a problem. I'll I'll keep the screen. The screen or the slide? The slide. Sir. Slide. Okay. Yes, sir. That would be fine. Camera is off, right?
So, so you are muted, sir. Okay, I have unmuted myself, my screen. Please confirm if you can see my screen, uh, Janami, please. Yes, sir. Your screen is visible. Okay. okay. Uh, welcome back, uh, students. Um, as I said, 11.56, I'm back. Now, what I'm going to speak from now onwards, I'll recap what I spoke till now. One is we, we saw the how SAP as a product came from a mainframe system to um, uh, current S4 HANA where you have uh, the same content being accessed through multiple uh, devices, mobile, pad, uh, laptops, desktops, etc. Then we also spoke about uh, what is the difference, uh, how, uh, what is the difference between various methodologies, how we move ahead with uh, moving from the existing system to S4 HANA and what are the various challenges uh, that it poses. And we also spoke about what is the methodology, why a methodology is required. Now I'll explain why a methodology is required. Then we'll go to each and every step, what it means. Okay. Firstly, uh, if uh, somebody has seen an SAP implementation earlier, one SAP ECC implementation, the screens that you are seeing today, that you would have experienced that you, uh, you practice today, would take around two to two and a half years to implement. Now, the challenge. Today, in today's world is in two years, technology changes so much. OK, earlier uh, there was no mobile in two years. Mobile came in now incoming. I, I remember I was paying 16 or 20 rupees per uh, minute. Today incoming is totally free. OK, then if you if I go to any village, there is data. You are traveling in a train for 12 hours. You're continuously connected with data. Plus, we also have various. I also uh, keep uh, training in SAP and uh, statutory filing and various other things like GST and income tax. We have simulations of all these where you can actually practice how to file GST, how to file income tax on a simulated environment. So I do take sessions on that. I would have gone to nothing less than 100 colleges pan India, maybe even the remotest of the remote village. Uh, tire two, tire three cities as they call. There is not a single student till date, till date, who has said he does he or she doesn't have a smartphone. It is not just true in the urban areas, semi-urban, in the rural areas also. Every every student had a smartphone. Now this poses various challenges for for uh, systems like SAP, which is now. Take, uh, taken care in S4 HANA and Fiori solution. When we are putting all this in two years, the technology will change so much that by the time you start a project and end the project, things have changed. So we needed a methodology that shortens the time and of course reduces the cost. And most important, when you go big bang from zero suddenly to the big new solution, uh, the challenge you will face is what if it doesn't work? Just imagine, I'll take a, a simple example, okay? Let's say we are having a, uh, let's say HBC, uh, Hindustan Petroleum or Bharat Petroleum. Bharat Petroleum, we all know, is one of the largest uh, petroleum company which refines petrol and uh, sends, fills in trucks and sends petrol and diesel to various uh, petrol pumps. Imagine their system getting stuck for one day, which means not a single truck can leave their campus. Now the refinery will get blasted because simple, where will they store the refined petrol if the petrol is not going out? Imagine what will happen to each of the petrol pump because they need supplies to sell petrol. And then what happens to each and every car on the road if petrol is not reaching those petrol pumps? OK, so to, that's a huge risk involved. So to reduce the risk, they came out with something called incremental approach where you add solutions one after another that reduces the risk. OK, overall, if you see, I'll be explaining you these six phases about what this activate methodology is all about. Now let's go and see what each of these methods mean and why should we do this? One, overall total cost of implementation gets reduced, reduced timelines, so reduced cost. There are lots of templates and accelerators uh, that is a part of it, including guides for implementation, which 
one spe speeds up the implementation of SAP, plus it also uh, ensures or guides, I will not use the word ensures, guides the end customer with the global best practices so that their business processes can be refined to the global best practices. OK, the value that a customer is going to get is transparently seen. And overall, when we look at any project, you will have to manage the project very carefully. OK, whereas you are managing the project very carefully, each and every stages has to be managed and monitored. That can be done very easily using the uh, activate methodology. And last but not the least, this uses the agile implementation methodology, which helps set up solutions step by step, reducing the risk. So these are the various benefits of activate methodology. Now let's see what each of these phases mean and what are the activities that are done in each of these phases. Now first is the prepare phase. Now let me first is a discovery phase. I'm just skipping detailing of the discovery phase. If you see here to the left bottom, you will see the discovery discover phase. Discover phase is when a customer is yet to decide whether to go for his 4 HANA or not, what value will I get if I'm going to spend X dollars or X rupees or X euros? So that is the discover phase. Assuming that the customer has now decided to move ahead with implementing or going ahead with the implementation of migration, we choose to do it on the activate methodology. Now, what is activate methodology? First, you have discovered, then you prepare. Now, what does this prepare mean? See, typically in any project, one is the customer and the end user and the customer. You're all going through the power user course, wherein an end user, power user is the senior most person who can guide other users also. That person is a part of the project. Okay, you will come out with various business processes that are required that as a power user wants. Then you have a partner who will be implementing it. These are all SAP consultants. They have no clue about the customer's business process, but they know as SAP consultants how to implement, how to customize, what problem is posed by the customer, how to resolve it. This is this is the this is another set of people who come only for this project and they deliver. Deliver the business processes the way the power user wants. OK, now when these two people are coming in, there has to be commonality. What is this commonality? What is the project plan? Each one should know what am I going to do today? Just imagine every 10 people come together and they don't know what they're going to do today. And each one is talking in different directions. Simplest thing when we plan a road trip, let's say from one place A to place B, we plan how to go from A to B. If we, are we going to drive, are we going to take a train, are we going to take a flight? And what time is the flight? We book our tickets. If it's driving down, what is the directions? Do we blindly follow the Google map or we we uh, ask somebody and go or we check what is the what is the route that we should take? So all these things are put in something called a project plan. Along with the project plan, there is also something called a project charter that is developed, which talks about what language will be used. It's as simple as it is. Example here, OK? I just saw during the break there were 1,400 students or 1,600 students, approximately 1,500 plus students are there. So each, some students know the language that I speak with my house, that is Canada. I speak Canada. Not all the 1,600 students who are right now online would know Canada, OK? So we are speaking in English. Such commonalities are drawn, such norms are decided, and the detailing of this goes to such a level. What is the minutes of the meeting template? When will we have reviews? There will be a steering committee that is formed only to manage this project, which means this committee will decide on behalf of everybody. OK, and the decision of the steering committee is, is the final one. There has to be an escalation matrix. Now, what is an escalation matrix? If somebody is supposed to do a task, he or she has not done it today, tomorrow, after 10 days, that's going to delay the project. It has to be escalated up the line. Look, this guy is not doing his task. There is a delay. So those detailings are done in the prepare phase. 
okay which talks about the complete roadmap what is the approach we are going to take how often will we review where will the project location be the best example i can give you is right now uh, i am also a part of a steering committee of a project uh, they have main business in a place called kuwait in the middle east they are also delivering projects they their establishment in saudi dubai and in india okay now where will the project be from we decided it will be in a hybrid model fine in india where when you say hybrid where will all the people meet so we have decided that would be in kuwait so when will everybody let's say people from saudi people from dubai people from india all will be in kuwait now it it doesn't i mean it will be a mess or chaotic if five people land on a particular day and they leave after 10 days and then the saudi team comes it's chaotic so this project plan will clearly decide what is going to happen from where and how things will happen where it will be this detailed plan will be shared with everybody it's typically approved jointly discussed and approved that all these things are done in the prepare phase then in the prepare phase what is also leveraged is the best global best practices for any industry there are global best practices which are shown to the customer my dear friends these these are the global best practices do you follow these processes so many times what happens a customer agrees to change their process and accept the global best practice there are some they say look we are different and majority of the customers say we are different our business processes are different then we build something called a baseline that is where we move to the explore phase in the explore phase we decide we decide uh, you we build the baseline of the solution then this is getting validated with what is available readily in sap what has to be built in sap okay that detailing is done in the explore phase after it is done in the explore those details are done in the explore phase there will be a delta delta in the sense something that is missing there will be a list that would be made we'll prioritize what has to be done first what has to be done later then we release it for building it when i say building it we will have to configure the system okay in sap there is something called spro screens uh, nagraj our uh, faculty would have shown you those screens uh, i don't think you will have access to spro uh, but that as sap consultant would have Uh, power user typically are not given spro access so that access is taken and then they go and click on those those tabs uh, that particular field those changes are made and then after they make those changes they do unit testing after they test uh, let's say finance test only the finance pieces production people will do the production testing and uh, you have the uh, uh, sales guys doing the sales testing materials guy doing the materials testing now that is known as unit testing but please understand sap is a highly integrated solution now what it means is that anything that happens anything that happens in the system any transaction an example uh, a, a procurement is done for 10 lakhs and a payment is released for 10 lakhs when payment gets released for 10 lakhs i'm just giving an example just see what all happens payment is released from accounts payable that is removed and it goes and hits your pnl statement it goes and hits your balance sheet things will all change numbers will change correct because it is an integrated system if it was a disintegrated system the procurement guy will will issue a check or pay 10 lakhs and then somebody comes and tells the finance guy okay 10 lakhs is released then somebody again comes and updates the system it doesn't work like that in sap it is all integrated everything changes automatically within the system okay now after the integration so which means the solution that we are building has to be tested in an integrated manner now what does this mean all the module people are sitting in one place they are sitting in one room somebody creates the sale order somebody clears it somebody does the goods and word the quality guy will check the quality and then approve it or reject it and then they test what happens when you approve what happens when you reject and finally 
the payment is made and then when the payment is made, the finance guy immediately goes and checks are all the fields updated properly. That is known as integration testing. Then we set up the complete setup for operations. There are a few things that has to happen. Now our solution is in place. Now we train the trainers. This is here the power user comes into play. Now power user is a person who was involved all through in the project. This person understands what the project plan is, understands what the solution is, gives inputs. What is required? What is my requirement? What is the solution? Is it OK? Any changes that are required on the solution? Then does the testing unit testing, does the integration testing, then they get trained as trainers and then they will have to go and spread it to all the users. Once it, the users are trained, there is something called a user acceptance test. So the power user does the user acceptance test. They sit on the system, they test the system, they say yes, it is working OK. So there is also one more small aspect called change management, because when we are moving from an old system to a new system, obviously it is human being who are going to uh, use these systems. There will be change management, there will be resistance. Those things are also taken care of. Then there is a cutover when you are switching from an old system to a new system. One, the master data has to be moved. There are certain open purchase orders. No purchase orders you have released, but the material has not come. Okay. You have released a purchase order for 100 items, only 50 have come or 10 have come. So these are known as open documents, which during cutover is moved into the system. Then we go live. When you say go live, you switch from an old system to the new system and start doing all your operations only in the new system. And then you go ahead with the uh, typical production support. So this is what the activate methodology means. You start the project with preparing it. OK, here we prepared what we did. We defined why are we doing this project? What is the role of every individual? Who is the project team? What is the plan? Now, along with the plan, you also will have to list various risks that are there. What is the risk I have in this project? How do I mitigate this risk? This is known as a risk plan. What happens if, let's say, from the implementation side, somebody, some person has to come. Let's say finance consultant has to come, but he or she has not come. So there has to be an escalation matrix. All these are well documented in the prepare phase. OK, and even in this whole uh, while these are happening parallelly, we are also picking up the global best practices and then we are going to put it across to the customer. So this is the prepare phase, the first phase in the activate methodology. OK, in the implementation phase. Next is the explore phase. Now here what is happening as I explained earlier, we are exploring the complete solution. In this phase, the complete baseline is built. We are going to tell, we are going to see how the system will work. What are the various business processes? Are all my business process covered? An example, in the production, uh, let's say uh, procurement process, there are various types of procurements. One is you procure goods, ready goods, or some goods you take and then you will have to work on those goods or you will, you will procure raw material. There are some services you procure. OK, so how do I procure services? How do I produce a product which is a combination of services and raw material? Now what are these? Now all these processes are getting put in here, built here. After having built these solutions, you will validate whether all my solutions are covered is something pending or something covered or something not covered. So after just a second. OK, after these are done, you will also look into the gaps. Gaps in the sense, look, this process is not covered. Services procurement is not covered. Within services procurement, there is a quality check that has not been incorporated in the process. So those gaps are identified and we look at whether there is a standard solution in SAP. If there is a standard solution that is triggered, if that standard solution is not there, we will have to build a solution using the technical team. OK, they will write a piece of code. They will build it. They will test it, hand it over to the function guy who will test it. Then in the Delta design, everything is ready. When the complete design is ready, we release it for building it. Now, most of the cases, some of these work is done on SAP. Most of the work is done on the laptop using Excel, PowerPoints, and Word document. 
Now we switch to the SAP system in the built phase. Now in the in the realized phase, what we do here, we build the system in the sense the SPRO that I spoke about that is used for configuring your business processes that you have already approved. Typically, this is there is a physical sign off also that happens uh, between the two parties. The power user says this is exactly what you want, but then it is just a verbal word. It is physically documented. Uh, many a times it is approval is taken on an email nowadays. Earlier it used to be a physical printout that used to be signed so that tomorrow the power user cannot go back and say no, it is not A, B, C. It is A, B, C, D. Now the power user would have missed saying D, but then tomorrow they may come and argue. I told you to avoid all this confusion. There is a physical document that is created, not a physical one, maybe a soft copy document. A PDF is created and then that gets approved or an email. Then based on that document, the SAP consultant does the customizations and configurations in the system. Now based on this configuration, he or she, the consultant first tested themselves. I have configured it for, let's say, the currency as Indian rupees. Is the currency in all my transaction coming as Indian rupees or has it switched to dollar somewhere? So all this testing is done. That is the unit testing. Then as I spoke, this is a, an absolutely integrated solution. We do an integration test. Now, typically in case of an integration test, there are few dates that are blocked. Every module consultant, every power user, finance, procurement, sales, production, quality, all sit in one place. OK, they look at the common screen. They run the end to end process. Let's say various processes you have already studied in the in the beginning of these sessions in SAP O to C order to cash or you have procured to pay hire to retire. So all these processes are there. All these processes are run from end to end. Somebody is creating a procurement document. Somebody is approving it. Somebody is uh, uh, taking the goods inward. Somebody is doing the quality check. Somebody is clearing the payment. All this end to end cycle is done and they check whether it is the data is flowing correctly. It's all fine. That is known as the integration testing. Then along with the power users, if the, if the number of end users are very large, just the power users will not be enough. They, we will rope in more people who will then we do the train the trainer. So the power users would be going ahead and training all the end users. OK, then we set up the operations. During that too, there is also one final test called user acceptance test. The user physically does their operation. They do their operations and say, yes, our system is working perfectly. All right, we are OK and they sign off this user acceptance test. OK, then the production in terms of organization, what master data is required? What is the cutover data that is required? When will the cutover? Best example I will tell you. Uh, typically, some companies run their payroll on the fifth of the month for it for for that matter for the salaries to be released on a of May. They run the payroll on the fifth of June. Only after the payroll is run, the payables are made. Uh, the data for 31st of May can come into the system, correct? So there what would happen? We will have to wait till fifth. Take out the data on sixth and then move to the new system. That is where the cutover. There is a strategy. There is a meeting that happens. There is a cutover strategy that is done. There is a cutover strategy document that is made. Based on all these, the cutover happens. All the end users, whoever is supposed to key in the data, will are explained how the data uh, has to be keyed in, what transactions has to be done, how it is. Everything is done. That is known as the end user training. To repeat. The system is configured. Various testing is done. At this time, the training strategy is also planned out. I just gave an example of the customer in Kuwait, Dubai, and uh, India and uh, Saudi. The end users are sitting all over, scattered all over the world. And in this case, in these four different countries, how do we get them? Okay, we did a project um, um, in India. Let's say that was a uh, Aditya Birla Group's uh, cement plant. They had cement plant in four different uh, Birla group, not Aditya Birla. Now it is Aditya Birla. Earlier it was BK Birla group. They had cement plant in four different locations and their sales offices were spread across some hundred locations in India. 
and it is the sales people who will have to key in the sales data and take out the sale order now how do they do it how do we train them we cannot send one person to 100 locations right so we had to decide on the common place where they will all come which day they will come how many days of training will happen for them to be trained they would need computer access will they be provided access so all the strategy is made that is known as a training strategy physical servers are prepared if it is cloud it is all in cloud required data is done user training and finally the user acceptance testing is done now that the users have also accepted fine your system is working fine we are okay we can go live then we go live with the new system now when we go live when, what i mean by go live is we are switching from the old system to the new system and then initially any new system there will be lots of challenges some problems people would not know how to run a transaction earlier system we know but this system we don't know it is where power user become becomes a real key person they will reach out to the power user who will provide the hyper care okay and then afterwards there is continuous improvements that happen in the operations they can keep on saying what is to be done what is required etc so I, I just summarize what I spoke about activate methodology. First was the prepare phase where you onboard the team, infrastructure is set up, team is enabled, uh, various uh, documentation is done, and then you have the business process maps that are developed and then the development environment is there. Then with these business process maps, we do the fit gap analysis, whether it is all okay, whether it fits into all the uh, processes that you require. We finalize on the list of solutions and then we also finalize on the custom development, the non-standard development that has to be done. We work out on the data migration plan and the testing strategy. Then we switch to realizing it in terms of configuring it. We, there'll be sprints, small, small configurations are done and tested. OK, then you do the integration test, user acceptance test. It's all done. We do the pre go live check. We deploy it on a on a new system. We Explain the open purchase orders, open payments to be made, payroll details, etc. are all moved into the new system. Then we establish a support mechanism. The power users who are identified as power users will provide first level support, second level support is provided by the support team. So those details in detailing are being done. Then we go ahead with the go live, various checks are done. And then there is typically what we call is a go no go uh, meeting. That go no go meeting will decide whether we are going ahead with going go live or not. That day we decide we move from the old system to the new system. At midnight or whatever time they decide, the old system is stopped and all the transactions will be switched to the new system. Then, then later on comes the run phase wherein if there are any issues, or data issues, process issues that are evaluated, issue resolution, we stabilize the system and we move into the new system and later on after the hyper care we call typically it is one month or three months it is handed over to a maintenance team which runs the system and maintains the system this is the activate methodology now this is exactly how the uh, sap is implemented the same methodology is used for you remember i spoke about if there is an existing system and how do we move from an existing system to s4 hana that uh, which i also explained as uh, system conversion the same process is used for system conversion and for new implementation this is a slide that gives the the clear difference between how what are the various differences in the in the steps that are taken the methodology is the same discover, prepare, explore, realize, deploy and run. However, the steps that would be taken would be different. In case of system conversion, first there is a technical evaluation that that, that, that is done. That report uh, is taken out. Basically, that is a technical report that talks about how much pieces of code you will have to change, which part of the code has to be changed. What are the business processes that you were using doesn't exist as a standard. All those things are uh, a report is taken. Uh, once that report is taken, then you have the functional conversion and the uh, uh, cutover that is done. Then you integrate it, you extend it, and then you deploy it in the new system, and then you switch to the new system. That is how a conversion happens. In case of a brand new implementation, or as what, what we call as a greenfield implementation, first you have the discover phase. You have you experience the trial where you get a feel of 
the new system, the HANA system. You fit that to the standard analysis with the best practices. Then you can you do the fit gap analysis. You prioritize what is to come first, what has to come later. Then there is a scope and you configure it. You migrate it, integrate it, test it, and then you move to the new system by going live and then you operate and monitor the new system. This is the end to end process of SAP activate methodology. OK, I hope uh, I could explain you various processes at the same time. Also give you a view about how it is uh, done practically. This is exactly how it happens in a real life scenario, how SAP is implemented later after the SAP is implemented. The support team takes over and production support is provided. OK, I take a pause here and I request my colleague to see if there are any questions about whatever I spoke till now before I come to the last part of my session. So uh, Janvi, are there any questions which I can answer and address? Yes, sir. one question is there that uh, the student has asked the SAP screen with which we have learned till now. Is hmm. is it SAP ECC? OK. Yes, the answer is correct. It is SAP ECC. Uh, you, we have not provided the HANA or the Fiori access. And I explained you earlier also is that uh, the reason we have given the ECC access is simple, that you are learning these screens and these transactions on a uh, manual gear car or a vehicle, four wheeler. So once you switch to HANA, the screens would be different for each of the customer. And it is very easy to switch from manual gears to automatic. If you're learning, please always learn on those screens. Because only when you learn those screens, it's easy to see. It's always easy when the uh, screens are easier to use. It will be very difficult for you to switch from the Fiori screens to the old ECC screens or the ECC screens. OK, so what you are experiencing and what you are practicing are the SAP ECC screens. Yeah, any other questions? No, sir, only these questions. OK, fine. I'll just uh, move to the last part of uh, my session. Um, that would take another 10 minutes. I'll just talk about what are the various career options uh, available when you learn SAP. OK, so let me go there. Firstly, is there a demand for SAP resource? OK, SAP did an analysis uh, way back in 2020. And they said the SAP ecosystem When I say SAP ecosystem. You have SAP as a company. Then you have various partners. I can name a few partners. So who are those? I'll only name a few large global partners like IBM, Deloitte, KPMG, Wipro, uh, LNT, Mindtree, uh, those days it used to be Satyam. Uh, and then uh, you have SAP themselves are also the, providing these services. Um, then you have Infosys, you have Cognizant, uh, you have Entity Data. The list goes on and on and on. They are all various partners. Then comes the end customer. Let's say Reliance. Reliance has a large SAP team that manages support for themselves. Only in Reliance retail, uh, I'm only talking of retail, which is a, a, a relatively a smaller system compared to the oil business of theirs. They have something around maybe 70 to 80 people providing SAP support. Support and new initiatives are taken up with them. Imagine in oil, they must be having some 200, 300 people. OK, the list goes on when I said what various businesses of Reliance. I just took one example. Geo for that matter. OK, SAP Geo, uh, sorry, um, Reliance Geo, I'm sorry. Geo, uh, if anybody is using a Geo mobile connectivity, that billing solution runs on SAP platform. And uh, I was uh, heading the project on behalf of SAP when uh, the Geo billing solution was happening. OK, so I was a part of even the initial testing right from the, the geo mobile connectivity test to the billing test. It was a very challenging project. They were talking about, you know, um, few thousand invoices to be generated every second. 
So you can imagine the complexity of those. So today, if they have, let's say, uh, five crore or 50, uh, five crore, let's say, five crore customers on their platform, every month they will have to generate five crore invoices divided by um, uh, days and uh, hours uh, and minutes. In a minute, you'll have to generate a few thousand uh, bills, invoices. Imagine the complexity. So that's how. Uh, that's why you need a large team to maintain those systems. At the same time, you also need a large team to implement it. So the ecosystem of SAP has SAP as an organization, various partners and their customers. Now in 2020, SAP said that SAP ecosystem currently employs 1 million, they use the word workers, 1 million people, that is 10 lakh people are there. Uh, in the ecosystem. This is uh, their expectation was they'll be adding approximately 3 lakh new net new consultants uh, from 2020 to 2024. Now what happened was COVID hit us uh, during this period. Few things that happened even for the SAP ecosystem. One, all the on-site or physical presence were, were stopped for those two years or three years, two years or one and a half years. So people moved hybrid or went work from home was the new culture. So the numbers reduced in net new, but now that is history. Things are more physical. The net new is much, much poor. They were talking about 1.6 million workers or that would be required or uh, maybe more by 2024. Now, these are not my words. These are from SAP's CEO who said this in a forum. OK, Christian Klein, the CEO of SAP says COVID-19 was an inflection point and they wanted to accelerate to move to cloud. Now, what happened uh, during COVID? Physical databases were moved away from physical to the cloud. Due to which uh, people were able to work from anywhere. Now there are two challenges that happened. One is how do we train those people? Enablement is a, is a challenge. Second challenge is constantly retraining them and new things come in a little retrain. OK, what does this mean is this means that the career options in SAP increased. OK, they wanted more people. Now physically one trainer can assemble everybody in one place, uh, but then now they said one trainer can uh, uh, train multiple people online from wherever they are, but there is a limitation. Now, whatever limitations were there is that if it's a physical training for global certification, it has to be limited to 30. 30, you can't handle more than 30 people. If it's a power user, it's fine. OK, so these are the challenges which actually post to SAP meant that they need more consultants. The SAP resources were in demand. OK, now when I say SAP resources are in much in demand, what is that? That role that these consultants would do and what is the progression path? Is there a progression path? Is there a growth? Is there an opportunity to grow as an SAP consultant? OK, yes, there is one as a business user. Within as a in a, at a customer's place, every power user has a huge potential. A simple example is if somebody has moved to SAP and uh, they need people who are preferably trained in SAP to come and work in SAP. Just imagine I hire 10 people and I have to train them for the next two to three months in SAP. That would be a major challenge and cost. So power user trained people are the people whom I would like to bring on board. They come on board. Fine, you may quest, you may ask me. I am only trained in ECC. What if they have Hana? No problems. You know the concepts. You know the processes. You know how it works. If you know to use these in an uh, ECC environment, it takes less than two days for you to learn in an Hana environment with theory, because it's all there on the screen. It is user friendly. You just click. Once you click, you need to know what to do, and that is taught in the power user course. That's beautiful. OK, now once you are a, you can work as a power user, you can also switch to project management. You can also provide support within the system. You can also move to sales and pre-sales or 
you can certify yourself an SAP as a global certified SAP consultant and move into consulting. These are the various roles that are available, not just at one place. It is available across the ecosystem of SAP. Now the ecosystem I explained are the customers, the partners and SAP themselves, SAP as an organization. OK, and what are the various roles? One as a business user. Next, as a support consultant, you can also switch to consulting or you can switch. To, you can progress yourself to project management or you can also be providing sales and sales support. Now I'll break this down into further. What is the progression that you will get? Nobody will straight away jump in as a, a senior most consultant. So you start off as a junior consultant. OK, as I said, your roles typically would be a functional consultant. And trust me, there's a huge demand for costing professionals. Now, costing is a very important uh, field that we are all experiencing. And uh, with COVID and various challenges that came up uh, in the recent world, one of the factors that everybody is looking at at the senior management level is the cost. When I say cost, it's not just about how much money we pay. What are the various integrities that are there? How is the costing calculated? How is it affecting my balance sheet? How is it affecting my P&L statement? All these are the integrities that a normal consultant cannot do. It is the costing guy, a person with a background of CMA are the right people. Now, MIS reports are required for the management to take the right decisions. I also showed the dashboard how HANA comes in beautiful. But where will these reports come from? It comes from the data. And the data is again uh, created or uh, keyed in by the various business processes people who handle these transactions at various levels, at the, at the various levels in terms of production or in procurement or in finance, etc. Now, how do we present the data to the management? That is where a management, a person comes in to decide how an MIS report has to be generated. What is those reports? What are the sort of data that a management would need to take the right decision? So these are the areas where a business user and a consulting person come together and work. OK, now any of these roles in any of the ecosystem, you start off as a junior functional consultant. OK, based on your experience, then you proceed further as a consultant. Now, when you are as a consultant, you again have various roles that you can think of. One, you can also play multiple roles. One, as a trainer, there's a huge requirement for SAP trainers. OK, you can be a trainer. You can be a freelancer, wherein you pick up assignments as and when required. You can be a team lead or you can be a senior consultant. Senior consultant in any of part of the ecosystem. From senior consultant, you become a pre. Uh, if you want to continue with consulting, that the path a functional guy will take is you become a consultant, then you become a senior consultant, then you become a uh, platinum uh, principal consultant, then you become a platinum consultant. Wherein you are all through in the consulting mode only. Okay, then there is another path progression path that you have from a junior functional consultant. You become consultant from there. You take the diversion towards leading a team and managing a team wherein you can become a team lead. You can become a project manager. You can become a program manager. OK, there is also another role that is in terms of solution designing. You can become a solution designer. You can become a solution architect. Similarly, there are various roles within uh, the ecosystem. As I said, any implemented system has to be supported. Now, what does the support is suddenly a new person comes in. He or she makes a mistake. How do we reverse it? How do we correct it? How do we train a new employee? Okay. How do we manage errors? We have done all sorts of testing. Does it mean it is absolutely error free? There will be something that crops up, crops up. There will be a new requirement. See, when um, India, Government of India decided to move from um, excise duty, VAT, and tax, they moved to GST. Now, 
somebody has to put those gst in place every year our finance uh, minister comes on the last week of february and announces various changes or various new things in the financial budget which may change an 18% gst can become 8% or 5% or 28% somebody has to put on making make those changes and these are all done by the support team so as a functional consultant you can be in the support then you become a senior support consultant and a principal support consultant so these are all the various options as individuals have in roles of sap now why are we talking about these roles not every uh, ca or a cma only follows that path a chartered accountant or a cost management accountant doesn't always just become a consultant it does become a cost accountant there are various other uh, uh, professions that are also available for them with their background of costing they are in huge demand for sap as a chartered accountant they have a huge demand in sap and this ecosystem is looking for such resources so you also have an alternate career path along with your cma once you clear cma and you are also trained in sap today you're so lucky that your institute is providing this sm this sap training with this training you uh, you can progress further by taking up the global certification and progress towards any of these roles also okay and uh, these are all various options that a cma has of course you can decide what role and how you want to devise your own career path okay so with this uh, i'll uh, wrap up my session i'm open for any questions that you would have uh, i'll be here for the next 5 10 minutes any questions uh, janvi can you please roll out those questions if there are any and then before we wind up the session yes sir uh, so pertaining to the topic one question is there yeah so can we perform all this career options of sap apart from cma degree or with cma okay so i really didn't get this question can you repeat the question please yeah can we perform all this career options of sap apart mm. from cma degree or with cma yes they absolutely correct you can okay so if you have a cma degree okay you are a costing professional and the demand is huge for those people okay for some reasons when you are doing cma and uh, not a, i think the passing percentage is not 100% for sure so if you are not cleared cma still you can pursue these path you can also parallelly do cma at the same time you can also be an sap consultant definitely these two are parallel tracks which can be taken up parallelly any other questions so pertaining to the topic uh, there are no questions only the students are asking for the assessments <laughs> okay the assessments tentatively would be from the 27th of this month okay however we are yet to get the final word from the institute so this would be an mcq or i think it is 50 50 questions will be there the pass mark is 50% and uh, in the system you uh, if you go to energy or energy 360 or energy vidya whichever access you have there is a question bank Uh, you can go through that is only a guidance for you uh, that is definitely not 100% of the questions uh, that are there it is only uh, a guidance that is provided to you to to for you to understand what sort of questions uh, would uh, come in the mcq you can prepare yourself you would have attended these sessions just by attending these sessions you will be able to uh, clear the assessment uh else you can also hear the recording i understand recordings are already available you can listen to the recordings and you can take up the assessment tentatively we have been informed that the assessment should be from 27th however please wait for the official word from the institute please note i would also like to add here when there is an assessment you will have to schedule the assessment there will be a mock assessment for a day where you can practice it there be only five questions just to get a feel of it that is not mandatory it is optional plus you will have the assessment 
you will have to schedule it a day in advance. Like for example, if you want to take an assessment on the 30th of this month, you will have to schedule it on the 20 before 29th. Uh, it will be uh, whatever is the duration. There are various slots available. You can pick and choose any slot which is convenient for you, and you will have to take the assessment in that slot only. If you do not attend, for example, if you have uh, blocked a particular slot and you do not take up the assessment, that would be considered as failed. OK, so please book your assessment well in advance, schedule it a day in advance and you take the assessment in that period only without fail and all the very best for your assessment. And the result is immediately shown. You have a maximum of three attempts. If you if the moment you clear the assessment, you will get the result immediately. If you have cleared more than 50 percent, uh, there are three attempts. The third attempt you will get the result after a day and uh, the certificate. We will also announce when the certificates will be available. It can be downloaded from the system itself. OK, uh, for a simple question on assessment, I've given you the end to end uh, view of the assessment. I hope it is very clear. Any questions? No, sir. Mostly the questions are for assessment only. OK, any other questions on any other topics? So I'll be here online for the next five minutes. So it can be any questions, whether it is on SAP or non SAP, you're relevant for assessment or your access. You're most welcome to ask me now. Yes, students, we'll wait for another five minutes for the questions. One question is, can we give test with mobile the assessment? Definitely you can take up uh, it's OK. Uh, you can definitely take up the questions on your mobile, but please note these are Chrome browser based or Safari browser based. It becomes too difficult for you to uh, take it on it. One is the technically the answer is yes. Yes, you can take it, but it becomes a bit difficult for you to look into the screen and answer it. So it's recommended that you take it from a desktop or a laptop or a tab bigger screen. But a straight answer to your question is technically it is definitely possible to take this assessment to the MCQ on your mobile. But I strongly suggest and recommend you take it in a slightly bigger screen. It can be a desktop or a laptop or even a tab. Please note these are all on these are browser based. That's the reason we made it as browser based. Uh, so that it is uh, as you I just spoke on SAP. Uh, having uh, we were able to access SAP screens and multiple devices. This can also be accessed in any device, whether it is mobile tab or laptop or a desktop. It's recommended that you go for a bigger screen. Uh, it, the screen becomes too small and you know uh, the options you may choose a wronger option or, or whatever. Yeah. Any other questions? So pertaining to the assessment only, they are asking what is the passing mark for clearing the assessment? OK, it's 50 percent. You will. I think SAP has 50 questions if my memory serves right and 25 would be the passing mark. Yep. So one student is asking for other three training courses other than SAP. OK, we need to wait for the instructions from the Institute. So SAP is what they have asked us to do. We have done it. We are waiting for the clearance approval and the instructions from the Institute. In terms of skill training, if you have seen, there are four topics, but we have been told to handle SAP as of now. So once uh, whatever uh, message we get from Institute, immediately we will conduct the other sessions also. As I said, we are awaiting the uh, information from the Institute. Any other questions? Will I, be, will I be able to see those questions? Yes, sir, you can see it. Uh, OK, go in it. The SAP screen with which we have done, OK. Let me, OK.
is there pdf mcqs available for assessment ishwar i didn't understand your question uh, i what i meant was that uh, there is a pdf document that is available which is a question bank it's not a complete quiz it's just a sample question bank that uh, gives you uh, how exactly the mcq should be okay bhavish thakkar has asked me a question question is coming from this learning training only yes you are right um, uh, this would be um, from this learning uh, this training only sir so we have three attempts to clear assessment right so if i cleared or scored the pass in first no need to correct who has this question somebody has asked this question saying if there are three attempts uh, if i clear in the first attempt um, do i need to know you will not have access to the other two attempts also once you have cleared uh, that's it if we failed three attempts what should we do if fail in exam can we give another okay if you fail three attempts you need to write to skill training and uh, depending upon what institute's decision is they may give additional one or two of uh, chances or whatever institution instructs institute last time gave uh, uh, one more additional uh, attempt uh, two more additional attempts so um, uh, it all depends on the institute's uh, decision okay when will we get the mail of assessment we are waiting for the confirmation from the institute passing marks i said it is 50% when this exam it is uh, most probably from the 27th we will have to check okay the 27th onwards so any fee for, no there is no fee for assessment is there a chance of postponement of assessment because of cma Uh, you need to write to the institute maybe you can write to skill training we will take it up with the institute see what would happen is there would be an assessment date that would be given now and depending upon what has been the uh, number of people who have attended how many people have cleared there will be fresh dates also that will be announced maybe after the exam also there will be after your cma june exams also there there might be um, um, uh, a problem there is a probability of uh, assessment of course these are all decisions from the institute so i will not be able to comment on it based on the uh, decisions it will be done will there be questions on transaction code i think there are one or two questions i don't really don't know yes how many total marks of exam of sap as i said it was 50 and passing mark would be 50% i don't have access code of cambridge soft skill what to do okay so cambridge soft skills and others are the other three topics we are now focusing only on sap login credentials for sap exam so there is no separate login credentials if you have energy 360 or energy vidya access the assessment is also in the same platform yes. if not pass in sap institute will not issue hall ticket i think earlier it was like that i think this time they are issuing the hall ticket but you will have to clear it is what my understanding is this again has to be addressed by the institute these three attempts will be happening in these days only okay so we are we will be uh, opening the assessment uh, whenever the, whatever date the institute gives that may be uh, as my understanding is it, it should be from 27th okay that gives you some time for you to practice and be prepared for the exam and uh, it will go on for 14 days or a month or whatever it, it all depends on it um, what the institute says duration of the assessment it is uh, sap would be for 50 marks for 50 minutes so 50 questions one question one minute is there offline training for sap i really don't know there is, i can't comment on it where will you find the mcq pdf it is there in the uh, energy vidya portal or energy 360 you can go and uh, get it all four topics now as of now it is only sap is there any slots or time the exam that we have to select the choice is yours no which have whatever is your convenient time and your availability you can pick the uh, pick the uh, slot uh, okay you can attend from anywhere uh, this particular assessment is online so you can attend from anywhere you need not go to any designated center uh, last date will be announced along with the date uh, when the assessment is happening 
server ID given and guidelines, what can I do? There is a question asked which says, I'm unable to use the SAP um, app with server ID given and guidelines. Please uh, take the screenshot of what problems you are facing and send it to skill training at ICM and Autumn. They will respond back to you. Is exam connected? No, it is there for multiple days. It is not one day. How much time given for one question? Each question is one minute. Should I continue to be studied to you? <laughs> it's always preferable that you go through the full content to take the assessment, but uh, it is, the choice is yours. Camera should be enabled. As of now, this assessment, there is no camera requirement. Okay, Abhishek, as I said, as of now, it is only for SAP. We are waiting for instructions from uh, uh, the Institute. Sir, how we apply for a slot? We got a mail or something? Yes, you will get a mail when the assessment is there. You will have to go and uh, take up the assessment. Is the assessment monitor? Assessment is monitored from the back end in terms of the IP number and others, but there is no physical monitoring in terms of uh, um, your camera being on or a physical uh, trainer as of now. So, ah, go ahead. So, one more thing is, uh, students are asking if uh, if exam is for SAP uh, or other topics. We have two uh, things, sir. So one is uh, Energy 360 people and Energy Vidya. Those. So, so we have to clarify. Yeah, yes. whoever has Energy 360. All the th all the three topics will be there for energy vidya. It will only be SAP. Uh, somebody has asked a question. Uh, what if we don't receive link in the given date? I will receive the remaining classes link for all three days before. I didn't get the question. OK, so is it online live test? Yes, it is an online uh, test. You will have to take it online. What is the time duration for assessment? It is uh, one minute per question. And depending upon how many topics uh, you will have those number of questions. Where to give assessment exam? It will be online. Can we give SAP exam after CMA? We will have to see what the institute's instructions are, how many days they will they want us to keep the assessment open. We'll be uh, doing it. Can I receive? I missed a single class. I didn't get your question. Sorry, I haven't received energy mail. What can I do? Uh, it all depends. If you have any challenges, please write to skill training uh, at ICMA Norton. If we cleared first attempt, yes, you're right. One attempt is good enough. How do we know whether we have passed the exam or not? Like it shows. Yeah, after you click the submit button, system will tell you how many questions were correct and whether you clear the exam or not. Yeah. No, there are no negative marks. Once assessment completed with this, SAP access is available for a period of three months, so you can use it even after the uh, exams. Uh, your results will come immediately uh, on taking up the assessment. How would we know that we have passed the exam like it does so we have passed after the exam? Yes, you will get to know uh, the moment you click on the submit button. See, if you miss, if you block a session, okay, uh, and if you do not attend the, the assessment or the test, it is considered as failed. Is the 60 hours training enough for a job? It again depends on what job you are looking at. If it is for power user or a user in support, definitely this is enough. More than enough. Can we give it for a yes? OK, sir, we don't receive exam. Exam link is there is no separate exam link. It is there uh, within the system in energy itself. OK. No, if you have missed this attending a session, it will not impact the certificate. Your certificate is purely based on uh, your assessment. I've already answered this question. 
the exam will tentatively from the 27th. OK, it's one. We wind up the session as the fine uh, Chandli. Thank yes, you all yes. for your uh, patience, listen, patient listening. If you have any queries regarding the session, you're most welcome to send mail to skill training at ICMA.org. Is that fine? Yes, for sure. Sir. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. And thanks, Janvi, for coordinating. Yeah, thank you so much, sir. Thanks a lot thank for you. this uh, session. And hope students have got an insight about the global trends for SAP. And uh, we'll take a break now. We'll wind up this session and we'll meet again at 2 p.m. for the concluding session of SH SAP, which will be taken up by Nagraj. Thank you all. Have a nice day. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Bye bye.